Yeah. yeah. Good. Ready? Yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. Tonight um, at Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway, good evening, everyone. I'll, I'll just decide. Um, I'm glad to have everyone out tonight. I'm so excited to be out tonight. I have wanted to hear you talk for many, many days. Really interesting. <laughs> no, um, I know about Stephen Smith's gallery. I'm a Washburn student, and I have lots of questions. So I think this is going to be a great night, a great opportunity for anyone who sees this to hear about your work in how galleries, how gallery works, because that's what it's important to know as an emerging artist. So I'm so glad to introduce you, Stephen Smith. Thank you. No. <laughs> all right. So I, you all have a handout. Yes. Okay. And on the front side it says bio for me. And it gives you a little bit of history about me and what I've been involved in and those kinds of things. And you can read that at your own discretion whenever you feel like reading. Can you hear me okay? Alright. So, the second page on the second half whoop, is what we're really going to be talking about tonight. And when Barbara called, she said talk a little bit about uh, your photography and then the gallery and what I did as a career. So if you look there, you can see the timeline on my history. In 1978, uh, are you all familiar with downtown Topeka? There's a place called Clayton Wealth Management at 716 Kansas Avenue. I used to be in that building on the second floor starting in 76. And I was working at homework cards at the time, at night shift. Uh, went to washroom for a year, and then I went to uh, the Bo Tech School for a couple of years. And do all, any of you know Danny Cowan that used to work at Wolf's Camera? Mm -hmm. Danny Cowan, photography, he's an old guy like me, but if you were in photography, he was the man to go talk to. Anyway, he and I was in that school together, and we graduated together. And then he went to Wolf's to work, and during my second semester of that school, second year of that school, I met a guy by the name of Roger Craig and Herman Arm who were going into school, and the two of them had bought the old Hodge Portrait Studio. Anybody familiar with Hodge Portrait Studio? It had been in that building that I spent. Kansas Avenue for many, many, many years, and uh, they bought it because he retired, and so they gave me a tour of their place, and when I left the building, I told the two of them if they were ever interested in another partner, I'd be happy to talk to them. So three months later, I was a third partner, and then pretty quickly we understood who was going to be doing the work. Six months later, I bought him out, and it became Stephen Smith Images. Um, and so we were in, I was just part-time, because I was going to school, working at homework at night, running the, running the studio during the day, and we did that for about two years. Um, and it was a long, tough time. And then there was a place called the Palace Plaza. Everybody remember the Palace Plaza downtown? Well, back in 78, they converted the first floor into a little shopping plaza. So there were lots of little shops inside there. And they divided it up, and I was one of the ones that took the first floor space. And we put in a showroom and an art gallery. So back then, and we were showing paintings and pottery and all different kinds of art, along with the showroom for my photography. And that worked for about, that happened in May, and then in August, they opened up the second floor of the palace, and they put more shops up there, 
and I took one of those spots and put my studio, my shooting, where I did all the photography, uh, there. And on grand opening day, the fire marshal came in and closed it. Because the builders of the building did not find, follow fire code. And so they had to close the second floor. Well, all of those shops, the dress shops, all those shops that were up there, we had just a few weeks to find new places to go. And that's what happened in August at 931 South Kansas, which is where I currently am. That space used to have manpower in it, and it had closed, and it was available, so we took that building and moved in there. And it was a crazy year for 1978. So it was fun, it was exciting, but I was a new young buck that didn't know any better, and we were just forging forward. So when we moved into the place where I'm at now, we quit doing the gallery thing as well. So we just turned it into a studio and did, did, did photography. And then in uh, 1983, uh, Fleming Foods contacted us and uh, needed to have photography of their food for all their sale bills and things like that. And so we converted our basement into a mini quick shop. So we have a full basement and on the back half of it we had these shelvings, rows and rows of shelving of all different kinds of food that you find in a restaurant. And we had freezers down there for frozen products and they once a week the guy would come over and he'd pull out the boxes that they were going to put on sale that week. And we'd set it up in the studio area down there and we would photograph it, have the film process, send it over to Fleming Foods and or Graphic Promotions, with, which did all their production. And then they would, and every week for about 12 years we did that. Bring in new products, and then we threw new products away. So it, all the boxes were empty; they weren't full of product. But we we photographed the same steak for months at a time until it got so bad we could they throw it away and bring in new stuff. So it was it was an interesting time. And then they had a booming uh, part of their stores was over in Kansas City. And it was a little different than the ones here at Topeka, so I would go over to Kansas City and set up a mini studio in their grocery store, and they do the same thing. They'd go out, put the products in, we would shoot it, take it on, on my way home, we'd take it to our cover lab, they process the film while I waited, I'd bring the processed film back with me, and then, so we did that for, well, Fleming's thing was about a 12 year period, so we, Along with doing the weddings and the family portraits and all the other stuff that we did, that was a pretty good run. And it was kind of a kind of a staple that you could rest on for a while. So that's pretty cool. And then Fleming Foods decided that they could do their own digital photography and they bought some digital equipment and started doing that. And they did get out my basement, and they did that for a few months, and then they closed um, and did some. I don't know if the Fleming ever continued opening here or not. It was just that. Wasn't long after that, I went to a chamber meeting, and I met a lady by the name of Frances Dudley, which had the Florist Review magazine, and we got to talking a little bit. She said, we're looking for a photographer to do our floor arrangements. So we chatted, and we wound up converting our basement into a floral shop. So all those shelves, we had all kinds of flowers, and all kinds of baskets, and containers, and all kinds of stuff. And Talmadge and Jim and James, their art designers, they would come in once a week, and they'd invite designers from around the country come in and they build all these wonderful bouquets and wonderful flower arrangements. We put it in the shooting area and 
we would light it, shoot it, have the film process, bring it back, and that lasted for 11 years. Uh, during that time period, in 1990, we installed an in-house film processing. Our building used to be a bank in 1926, and in the basement and on the first floor, there's two walk-in bank vaults. And we converted the one into the basement to a dark room. And so we had film processing down there, so we would shoot it, process it, and within an hour they would be able, able to take their transparencies and go do the art. So we, that worked out really, really well. Uh, and they lasted for about 11 years, and then they thought that they could get their own digital equipment and do their own work and save some money. So they did cleaned out my basement, and uh, they did that for maybe a year or two, and then they closed. It didn't pan out the way they thought it was going to pan out. So, both of those experiences taught me a lot about commercial photography and the involvement in the commercial world. And then, during the process, we would be doing family portraits and seniors, all different kinds of photography. So it was quite a, those two experiences was quite an eye-opening experience for me, and working with deadlines and timelines, and it's just fun. It's just a lot of fun. Um, a lot of aggravation from time to time, but a lot of fun. And then in 1996, we installed a large, uh, in-house large format printer. So we put printers down there and we could print up to 44 inch size photographs. 44 inch by 8 feet or however long. So we had an in-house lab where we could process the film and then do the prints. And eventually the, all the lab equipment was donated to K-State for film processing because we switched to digital. And then we started just doing all our digital development and printing through our printers. And we still have the large format printing that we, that we do. So it's kind of cool to be in total control of whatever product we're putting out. Kind of cool. So that happened in 1996. And then in 2010, Edie, my wife, at the top of that page, it says, I'm a blessed and fortunate man. You can point at her and you can say, that's the reason why you're a fortunate man. That's one personal belief is when you have somebody beside your side that is cracking the whip and encouraging and supporting, it goes a long ways in helping your creative will do what you need to do. So, uh, if you're, not, welcome. you're welcome. If none of this other stuff happened, I would still be a blessed and fortunate man. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, in 2010, we uh, remodeled our second floor of our building to our loft. And we live downtown now. And it is amazing living downtown. Amazing living above our workspace. It's 28 steps up, 28 steps back, and I work right at home. And it's just a really, really cool environment to live in, to work in, and to have a rooftop. So that happened in the 2010, and then in 2016, we started. I started slowing down the photography business, and we started eliminating all the. Uh, volume type photography that we did in studios and all that kind of stuff and we started eliminating that because I was entering the next phase of life and when you hit 65 you know things start changing a little bit and so as far as in my mind as far as high production and high volume um, back in the early days we had photographers and staff that we had to manage and those kinds of things and 
I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to do that kind of thing. So it's just me and we scale well down, to, way down to just me and we have a part-time employee that helps out some of our hard work. And it's, it came really, really good. And so it got to a point that I was trying to figure out what we were going to do with the first floor uh, of the gallery because we had remodeled the first floor in 1990, tore everything out, and uncovered the antique tin ceiling, and we restored that, put new hardwood floors in, uncovered stone walls, and it was just a really cool. If you haven't been, we have a pretty sweet space at our gallery. At our, when it was a photography studio in the gallery. So it's, I feel pretty cool about it. But in 2018, well, 2017, the uh, folks across the street decided they were going to put in a uh, hotel, uh, Cyrus Hotel. And I knew Cody, and I've heard Cody talk about how he was building that hotel for him to bring in his people from all over the country to do his workshops and his advertising programs and marketing situations. And so I heard that and I knew that he was going to be bringing a lot of people in and we thought the gallery, the studio would be a pretty good place to, come, to put our gallery in. And so that's the reason why we converted it to a gallery. Not be it wasn't stolen that. I had an art gallery early on, and I've always loved art and loved creative people. And it's just always been a cool. Whenever we would travel, we'd go to art museums and galleries and we just get immersed in it. So to be able to have that kind of thing in Topeka and know that the neighbor was going to be bringing in guests from all over the country, all over the world. We thought it would be a good spot for, for them to see Topeka and see art. And so that's, that's the reason why we did it. And it made me feel good because I was having a very difficult time leasing the space out to somebody I didn't know and let them run, use that building to run a business. And I just, and it's my building. I couldn't give it up yet. I couldn't give it up. So to utilize it in such a way that we could help artists show their work was a very, very cool thing in my mind. So present day, we're showcasing artists and doing a little bit of photography, poquito photography, a little bit, for people that I've been in business with through the many years. Uh, mostly the gallery is open September through May. Uh, the summer months, we have a cabin in Colorado, and so we like to spend our summer out there and travel around the west, southwest, wherever we can explore, find new things to see, new places to photograph, that kind of thing. Um, so now that I'm almost 73, we are really enjoying that kind of lifestyle. It's been sweet. So, um, SSI, Stephen Smith Images, I've had the privilege of uh, photographing and working with people, very memorable moments, photographing clients' lives and sharing in their mountaintop experiences, and also sharing in their moments of anguish, pain, and, and, and sorrow. Uh, one of my early e events, and when we were in the Palace Plaza, there was these two twin ladies, and they were quite elderly, and one of the uh, ladies passed away, and the sister wanted a photograph of her sister. So we went over to the funeral home and made a portrait of her sister in the casket. And that was a very unusual thing for a young man to be a part of. But long after that, uh, Another family had, the father had died, and they did not have any kind of family portraits at all. And so Davidson's funeral home called and said, Could you, would you come over and make a family portrait? So we had dad in the casket, mom sitting in a rocking chair, 
the son standing behind her with his, her hand on the rocking chair, her hand, his other hand on the casket, and the family dog laying at their feet. And that was the only tortured family portrait they've ever had. Isn't that sad? But sad, but yet I was able to contribute to their sorrow in some way, to give them a little bit of peace, I guess. It was kind of, it's kind of cool. We had lots of interested, lots of instances throughout the year. So those kinds of things, really people having mountain high moments and just celebrating joy of what's going on in their family or children or whatever. And then other moments where it's just struggles. People suffering with illnesses and, and struggles to, to get by. And one of their last what they would call is their obituary portrait. Be photographed that because they so it was just a lot of the commercial stuff was cool, but the personal emotional thing was memories that will just stick with me forever. Forever. It's also uh, life presents opportunities to capture with a camera and present images to the world that I will never know what the outcome or the response was from those people viewing those images. Kind of like you when you sell a painting or a piece of sculpture or a piece of work and it goes into somebody's home, you don't know all the responses that are happening when somebody walks into that home or office and they look at that piece of artwork and how it makes them visually feel or emotionally feel. Once it leaves your easel and goes into another home, it affects people. You have no idea how it affects people. But it, it makes you feel good, at least the people that bought it. They're getting enjoyment out of it, but that reaches much long, much longer than just those buyers. Um, I've had the opportunity and fortunate to have assignments in Guadalajara, Los Conchos, Mexico, Brazil, from Berlin to Manas, Manas is on the Amazon, we were able to go down the Amazon, uh, Portugal, Ghana, Cuba, Akima, Turkey, from Istanbul to Diyarbakir, all, all across the state of Turkey, this country of Turkey, Turkey, and many other locations in the U.S. So having these kinds, in my photography career, having those kinds of instances where I could go to the world make photographs of lots of things and people would use those images for books and poems and to get a whatever kind of message across that they were trying to send. So it was just kind of exposed me to a lot of worldly behaviors and lifestyles of people that we as Americans have no clue. We are, we are so, so fortunate, but, you know, so fortunate that even our poorest people are considered rich in some of these countries. So it just made me have a whole different viewpoint on, on life here and how important paintings and photography can be that people have no clue. SSG, Stephen Smith Gallery, has allowed me to introduce new artists to Topeka from many places. So we've had artists from the East Coast, West Coast. Uh, we have one in now that originally was from London. Uh, we've got things from uh, Africa. Uh, Bubak, have you ever heard of Bubak? Bubak has showed at the Noel Lane Art Show. He's a neat guy. Land of the Tall Man is where he's from, but his pieces are pretty cool. So we're going to have him. We've got an artist coming back from uh, Philadelphia. Um, so we bring, we try to bring artists in from around you know, the country that Topeka doesn't normally get to see, and expose them to that, as well as expose them to local artists, particularly new artists that are just reinvigorating or trying to get back into the art scene. 
So, a little bit of a little bit of a mix, the established, and a little bit of the new, and then the student art that I just have. You've heard me talk about that. The art walk in with the students is just so fun. And watching their innocence and their excitement and their frustration while they're painting and thinking, oh my, what am I doing here? And Brad or I would just say, it's just paint. Start over. You got another, you got a canvas here that can breathe and go on and on and on forever. Just discover what you're trying to get across and make it work. So it's, it's just a lot of fun working with bringing artists in. <laughs> Coley Ryan from Philadelphia. She was, uh, her and her dad was going through Kansas to an art show in Colorado. And they stopped and had lunch at uh, the Pennant right downtown. And so as she was walking by, she saw the gallery and she walked in and started talking to me. And I said, where are you from? And she told me and told me her story. And I said, well, let me see some of your work. And she brought it out and it was, she a young girl, it was fresh, it was cool, it was all palette knife then. And I said, you need to do a show here. So she's been showing with us ever since, and she's got a new show coming up in uh, October that is out of her box. So she's excited to do stuff. <laughs> That's, that makes you feel good when new people, young people, are, are doing something. Um, and then uh, Janet, what's it, Janet Zobel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's an old timer like me, and she, she did a show for her that, on some of her new stuff with uh, the place in Florida. Um, she had a passion for that place, she had a cabin down there and it got wiped out with her paintings, so she was sh sharing her paintings about her life that was part of that, that scene down there. At the time, I did not know that she was a bronze sculptor and did a lot of the bronze, big bronze. So I was blown away by it. this little lady doing those big nasty things. So she was she was cool. So it was fun to introduce her new work into a, a gallery setting for her. Um, and then we have an artist that is a bit on vet, uses uh, art as therapy. Uh, and he's a 73-year-old guy and his heart is Looks like an old mountain man. He looks rough and grumbly, and but he's a teddy bear inside, and he just does all this art, abstract art, using all kinds of stuff from his trapping days, traps, and chains, and all kinds of stuff to move the paint around to where he wants it to go, and then he. We introduced him two years ago for the first time on Veterans Day at a Veterans Art Show. And this last year we did the same thing. But he was he was showing things and he is so humble, he's so excited about having this stuff being shown and sold that he gives 25% of it back to the Capra Foundation with uh, veterans with disabilities. So he's just given, he's given back what he's been given. And his kind of art is good for some people, not good for other people, but it's his, his interpretation of what makes him tick. And then we had another veteran last year that did clay sculptures, and it, just for himself, and it, like, again for that, for, for therapy, and he, I don't know if he came in and saw him or not, but they were the bartenders, the one art drinking man. Yeah, that's part of it. You're way ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got about that part actually. But he would make, he would make pieces of art that when he goes to an airport, 
at the bar, and so all these people line at the bar with their hand on the, their drink, with their head down, and so he created a bunch of sculptures of various kinds of people in that kind of scenario, and they're humorous, they're fun, the detail on them is just amazing. And so we, it took me a while to convince him to show his work, but he eventually did, and now he's, he still doesn't, his wife doesn't want him to sell them, but if they sell, they're fine, if they don't, he's happy. So it was able to introduce him to, to the world of the gallery. Um, I've been had the pleasure of shipping art or delivering art from coast to coast. Uh, so the hotel thing has really, really been a blessing in that way. Uh, Expose to people to Kansas a little bit differently and take something home with him. Uh, Phil Hirschberger, you know Phil Hirschberger? Mm -hmm. One of our hotel guests came in and she was uh, uh, India, Indian descent. Um, she wore the sh sharapis, is that what they call them? Sorry. Saris. She wore the saris for her husband and she came in and saw one of Hirschberger's piece is about a 50 inch by 50 inch painting and just fell in love with it. Well, her job, she had a, a consulting degree or business that they lived in the Poconos in Philadelphia. She would take her desk out into the trees and set up her laptop and she would do consulting with people about their emotional status from the trees, surroundings, and her job was to be therapy for people all over, the, all over the country from that little area. But she came in and saw that piece and just, just came back two or three days and sat in the gallery and just looked at it, got immersed in it, got immersed in it. And then her husband said, you want that? And she said, yeah, I want to wake up to it every day. And so it was, it was one of the pieces that I delivered, put it in the back of my vehicle and drove for two days and hung it on their walls in the Poconos. It was just a cool, cool, cool experience. And it was, <laughs> I had this house and you walk into their home and you walk up some steps and around and their bedroom was maybe 10 by 10. Is small, very small bedroom. So you put it on the wall. Their bed set right up against the, the wall. And you put it on the wall, and she, she would roll over and touch the paint. It was unusual. It'd never be where I would plan on hanging art, but that's where she wanted it, and that's what she woke up to every day. And it just calms her. So somebody told me long time ago, you don't take the pen out of somebody's hand. If somebody comes in and they make a statement about something, don't second guess it. So you don't really want to do that. Don't second guess it. Because they're the author at that moment. If they see something that they like that resonates with them, then they're the author. They, you help them, you help them fill their need or feel satisfied or wrong. And that's what, that's so cool to be able to do that kind of thing. So, some, one of the things in that last paragraph that the, allow me to help commercial clients, and this doesn't happen very often. Uh, a lot of commercial businesses, they're in the habit of buying box art or big box art, or online reproduction art to fill their walls because they can do it inexpensively. And I've had the good fortune of, and you can see it down there, if I put the list down there, of the, of the people, the businesses that have uh, purposely bought original art to decorate their walls. And some of these pieces have bought a lot of art 
uh, innocent man had done that for many, many, many years. And this one lady that they had bought a bunch of uh, watercolors, I didn't know her, but this is way before my time. But she did a lot of watercolors at the landscapes up in the Houghton area, because that's their audience is the Houghton area. But some of them had been matted and framed, and the mats had turned yellow, the acid was bad. So there was 20 pieces that we refreshed, took them out of their presentation, refreshed it, put new proper mats, new museum glass on it, new frames, and rehung them. But the other 20 pieces was brand new art, original art from a couple of artists in the gallery. And you walk into their bank, and it's like walking into a gallery. It's just amazing up there. So, pretty cool. And then these other people, they purposely put in uh, original art from local artists around here that helps them feel good about their community. It sends a very good message to the people that come in and do business in their business. It's just It's just heartwarming when people put a value on original art like that. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty cool. I've gone for 40 minutes, 30 minutes. <laughs> so, any, any questions? Did I ever left anything out? Not that you know of. It's been a it's been a day since my creative career, whether it's photography or working with artists, it's just been a real joy and a real blessing to to be a part of it. And to be able to take somebody's art and go hang it on their walls and those people get great joy and all I did was sell it. I didn't create it. To see the joy on their face of what it does to their home or to their office is just cool. It is. It's just cool. It's cool. So. I liked when you brought up the fact that art going out, uh, you know, you, the person who buys it, you know, they have joy with it, but we have no idea how far that goes and everything. I'm glad you brought that up because that that is true. Artists are communicators and so to have our ideas going out beyond the first purchaser. <laughs> we can't hear it. Thank you. Hear you. Did you hear what I heard? I heard what you said. <laughs> Am I to repeat all of that? Now we can hear you. Now you can hear me. Okay. I made the point that Stephen's bringing up the fact that the first person who purchases the art, you see the joy on their face and how, how they will like it. But it's interesting to think about the fact that the art goes beyond that and you have no way of knowing how others are going to respond to it. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, when you go to a gallery or I mean when you go to the museum, Crystal Bridges for example, you go to, have you ever been to Crystal Bridges? Wow, what a, what a treasure that is for the art of America. But when you, uh, when you go there and you are, you yourself are impacted from paintings that were done years and years and years ago and also things that are more current. And so you walk out of there thinking, enriched, enthused, inspired. So it, uh, it's kind of like that. Somebody goes to somebody's home and they see one of your paintings on the wall, a guest of whoever bought it, and they go, wow. And so they leave that home, taking a piece of you with them. And that is just, that's priceless. That's priceless. Now the buyer that buys the art 
if you can convince them that it's priceless, then they will open up a bigger checkbook. <laughs> That's hard. That's hard. It's the. Uh, are any of you familiar with art storefronts? Do you use them? Do you use them? I heard a pop class the other day from them. And if you're using them and you're having success with them, great. But he made a statement on the wall, on the podcast, that everything is negotiable. Everything is negotiable. If you don't walk into a gallery or talk to an artist and you don't negotiate with them, then you're not doing yourself a favor. And I just wanted to reach across the screen and slap him in the face. <clears throat> you don't go into this world <clears throat> thinking that you're going to do discount paintings. You don't do that. Uh, you got a value for it. Now, if somebody walks into your room and they're sincere, they really want the painting, but they want to know if you could do 10% or less, then that's between you and them. And if you get on the same boat with them and say, yeah, we can, we can work with you to get it in the home. But you don't put it on the wall and then put a for sale sign on it that says 25% off. You don't do that. Yeah. You let the buyer open up the door to talk to you about um, the opportunities to purchase. And if you can help them purchase it, and you're comfortable with it, whatever that price is, <clears throat> then that's great. That's between you and them. And so the artists that we have show here, I ask them if, if there's negotiating room. And some artists say, no, whatever the price is, that's what it is. Some will say, if you can negotiate 10%, I'll be happy I can do that. So there's a little leeway, because it does happen people come in and talk. Particularly some of these companies, when they're buying mass numbers, they, so we usually just, one that I just did that sold about 29 pieces, we negotiated 8% off. And he was, he was fine. And 8%, I was really fine with that. <laughs> Sometimes I ask 20%, I said, no, get real, get real. But, so that was, I hated our storefront crew. Like that. Put that in people's minds. You just, Go into this business expecting to cut your cut prices. And no, you don't. It may take you a little bit longer to sell, but your value is not being cheap. Let the buyer bring it up if they want to negotiate a little bit. And you negotiate on your terms. You don't negotiate on their terms. You can go to a certain point, but you don't go to where you're giving it away. Yes. Any question? I have a statement, a couple of statements. First of all, I was so don't everybody turn to work. <laughs> um, so anyway, I think the, the best thing I take away from this is that the soul of the painting is what I hear in your speech. Is that that's the most important thing that the artists can remember when they're emerging. But my question to you. Um, the reason why I wanted you to talk is because you've been in the business for a long time. And we have a lot of emerging artists here in Topeka, and that's why I think this group has the opportunity to speak to them. And I guess my one question I would have for you is, what would be this, a little piece of advice you could give an emerging artist? Recognize your value right away. Uh, the students, for, I'll use the students for an example. Uh, when they do their, their piece, we, we, when we start the, the project, the art block in, we say, now we're going to treat this like a normal gallery. So we'll put your art on, wall, on, the, on the walls, the value is going to be set, and then there's that 60-40 split. And we're going to treat you just like you are a full-time artist working. Okay. 40%, what's that mean? So they have to explain it to them for them to understand what it is. So, okay, all right, that's cool. And then when they bring the piece in, then I 
have a sit down face to face with them and we say, okay, your piece is this size, and this is your subject matter, and what's it mean? And then they say, you tell me the story, why, why is that? So they share with me about why they painted that piece. So they say, now what do you think the value of that is? Uh, $20, $50? So really, you just spent six hours, plus whatever time you were at home working on it, creating that piece, and you're going to sell it for $20 or $50. Yeah, yeah well, well, I'm new, I'm a kid, I'm a student, I don't, I don't have it. I said, wrong, you just poured your heart and soul in there, and you got value in there, that everybody else is going to look at it, and they're going to say, wow. So you need to be saying, wow, to yourself. So I give them the formula that we use to have a starting point, and said, so we start at 250 on the paintings this size. Oh, no. Yeah, no. You're not uncomfortable. I said, you got to be comfortable. This is your future life. Of the, you got to be. So it's, it's just an educational. And I have, it's amazing how many artists that have been doing it, that have been doing it for years, that bring their art in, and they have no value. They have no clue what the value of their art. So we give them the formula, we start at that point, and then we say, when you look at this piece and the content, and blah, 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 I personally feel like it should be up here. And some of the students said, okay. So we have students that are charging 750, 500, 300, some are staying at 250. The content is all different. And so, and they're all happy with it. Uh, Three of them have sold the 500 and two 300 dollar ones have sold, and they're just blown away. They're just people see the value in what you create. It's a beautiful piece. They don't know you from Adam. They see the piece. They see this title that you put on it, and their mind starts working. What's that mean? How do I connect with that? What's that do? And they and they buy from that. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Oh yeah, I just wanted you to say it in front of other people because you're right. That's the piece that people, they don't, they devalue themselves before they even get out of the box. They do. And so that's important for people to hear that, especially artists coming out of school. That it's important to have confidence in yourself in order to do that. Because if you don't, no one else will. You have to start with you. Yeah. So that's why I wanted, I wanted other people to hear that. Do you have any questions, Aziz? Anybody else? You, you might talk about final presentation, finishing the piece. Finishing the piece, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, in our gallery, if you're going to have a piece that is behind glass, uh, then the mats have to be 100% uh, rag or 100% museum quality mats. Just not decorative mats. They have to have that conservation free, acid free mats. Have to. And you have to use museum glass. Nothing other than that. It's more expensive to use. Uh, I know there's conservation clear glass that has the same RD values that the, that the museum does, but it has the glare. And so the glare becomes a distraction to the art piece. So if you do museum glass, Clarity of the art comes forward. The mats that you use are the last to life, the last to be on you. So, uh, those kinds of things are what we require in the gallery. And it requires the artist to spend a little bit of money to uh, present their work for the long term. In the framing, a lot of artists will. A lot of artists will pick up frames at uh, garage sales, garage sales yeah, at various places, and then they'll just slap the piece on there and call it good. Uh, and sometimes they get lucky and it it uh, accentuates the art, but more times than not, the frame takes away from the art, and it's the distraction. 
was a free, it was cheap, whatever, and you just devalue your art by putting those kinds of frames on it. So you think about presentation. I'll get you this second. When you're doing paintings and you're doing gallery wraps like what you see here, when an artist finishes the sides completely, so you can see the painting go around the side, or they make it a solid cover, like a black or something solid. You don't have splattered paint on the sides. You don't have unrubbed canvas on the side. Uh, you finish it so it's, it looks like it's meant to be hanging on the wall of somebody's face and not. You want to present yourself in a complete way, not as a haphazard way. And I'll back that up here in a second because I got a display right now that is not like right that. But we'll get into that in a second. Um, my question is uh, as a gallery, uh, if somebody wants you know, to apply to have a show or have a group show or participate, can you give us some ideas on what are the protocols or procedures that artists have to go through? Like, how do you select an artist? Or how do they, is there a form that they fill in to let you know that they want to participate? So what, is, what are the procedures for people who are here to have a artist to know that how do they approach you? Do they come and meet you or online or form? So if we can talk a little bit. Yeah, uh, three things. Uh, first of all, I have to see the art and not online. I have to see it person. Uh, I have to see it that way. Now I can see it online for the first time to see a, a little bit of interest there. And if there's, I feel like there's something going on and I'll invite them to bring it in. Or what I really prefer is to go to their studio and to visit their workspace. Because when you're in their environment, you see what they're inspired by. You see their working conditions. You see everything about them, what they're pouring into that art. So that's what I prefer to do, even if I have to drive an hour. If I'm intrigued by their work, then I'll drive to go see it. And it's enlightening what you, what you see. We just looked at one, looked at one in Burlingame. Burlingame. Bur what's that little town? Not Burlingame. South, North. South. Burlingame. Burlingame. You was with me. Uh, I was with you? Yeah. <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> Print maker. What was that thing? Oh, oh, oh. Baritone. Baritone. Well, yeah, Baritone. Baritone. Okay. It was just a Baritone. So he, he, he took me home and he showed, showed me all his work and it all looked great, blah, blah, blah. And then he, he said, let's see your workspace. So he took me back to his workspace. And it was nice. I mean, I mean, it's an old garage, but it was orderly and neat, and I could tell that he was taking pride in what he was trying to produce. I've been in some workspaces that it is scary. Yes. Scary. <laughs> it is. It is. It's a fire trap. You got all these fumes and explosive, but they put it, and it's them. It's, that's what they feel comfortable in, they're careful, and it comes out in their paintings, it comes out in what they're doing. So, anyway, I have to see the work in person. Second, uh, and if I like the work, then we go to step two, and through the conversation, uh, the interview type thing, uh, I have to like them as a person. Because we talk about not just art, but uh, what goes on in their life, what they do, blah, blah, blah. And I have to like them as a human being. They are, they're not an arrogant person. They're not an up here type person. They don't put down other artists. They, they're real about their work and they focus on that. And in whatever lifestyle they're in. And, that's a, and the third thing is, they have to like me. And if they don't like me, if they feel like I'm arrogant, or if they feel like I'm <laughs> some idiot, then, then we're not going to get along together. We're going to grind. And when you have a relationship like that, it is hard to, 
for both parties to feel good about what's happening. They're a part of the process, and then we have this agreement. Some people call it contracts. I don't know. I hate the word contract, but we have this agreement and we go through all the points about insurance and negotiating fee and all blah 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 blah. Time dates and stuff like that. And they sign that and they time frame, whatever it is, and we so we cover our bases, so we look professional. So we have that, we treat them professionally, we want them to treat us professionally, we have that kind of feel and that kind of look. And some, some of those clauses in there talks about when you get your prices set, when we agree on a price that's comfortable for you, and you feel like you want to be there, then when you go outside the gallery, your price structure on that body of work needs to stay the same, has to stay the same. Because you don't, and you just devalue me, you devalue your art and yourself, and that is not fun. If you have another series of work or body of work or something like that is, that is not what is shown in the gallery, then you, what you've got the freedom to do with that is what you want. So, I've had two instances where I've shown about the person's work, the great artist, and they no more than get it on the wall, but a week later, they're bragging about where their art has been shown. You can buy it at not gallery prices. Contact any person. Mm -hmm. That's not good. They will not be back in the gallery. That's just, that is, and they're, and I like them as a person, because they're nice people, but their business acumen is not what it should be, not what it should be. And you'd probably be surprised, there's two of them, you'd probably be surprised to they work. And that's not important, but it's an idea that they do that to themselves, let alone to the So, and so sometimes, you know, we get it right, everything feels good, they like me, I like them, the work looks great, blah, 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 and then things happen. So, as soon as the show was over, they were excused to pick up their work and go. Usually we've sold some of their work. Good, that needed to be sold, but does that help? That's my... That's Thank my you. requirements. Anyone else has any questions? What is the piece that you have outside that you said the edges were that I was curious? Oh. Say what? The pieces that you have that don't have the finished edges you were talking about that. This right here. You know, have you been to my website? Mm -hmm. Well, you haven't. Denise Evans, body of, that body of work here, her edges. This is a sad story. So this is a tribute show. Um, Denise is originally from London, and she wound up in Weston, uh, Missouri. Uh, in 1999, she was diagnosed with a bad disease, uh, and you can read about it on her on her website. Um, and so her life went from 1999 up to 2023 in and out of hospitals, under seizures, uh, 13 years of bedridden, lost all of her memory, blah, blah, blah. And it's just a, a gut-ripping, ripping story about how an artist, she got her PhD from the Slane School of Fine Art in London. She's a smart, smart, was a smart, smart person, had a lot going on with her art. And it's, it's just an amazing body of work. And she was a writer, wrote poems as well. So when you come into the gallery and you see her, what you see here is one thing, but when you see it in person, it takes on a different life. And she did all these paintings and never was able to do a show. She died. And so her husband got a hold of me, we got the art, and we're doing a tribute show. And and then, uh, right now, you can read about a story. Eventually, we'll make them available for 
but still. She just wasn't physically able to finish pieces. She wasn't able to finish pieces, and most of her work, all of her work, she intended for it to be framed. Right. Intended for it to be framed. So when you don't finish the sides, that's fine. Right. But right now we have her work. The front is finished, but the sides are not. But and we haven't invested the frame with a huge investment in the frame. So when we show people that tell people about it, then they can make a decision to frame it if they purchase it however they want to frame it, however they want to frame it. It's a it's a sad story. If you go to her page This takes you to the website that in 2017 they found a cocktail of medication that would help her only have two seizures a day. Prior to that, she's doing up to 40 seizures a day. In and out, just constant, in and out. And those two pieces right there, the uh, was done in the, the black part was done in the hospital bed between seizures. She was holding her phone with her with her uh, left hand, and she only had control over her thumb. And so she would draw those pictures. Now, while she's going in and out, all this, she had these visions in her head of what she was going to create, how she's going to create it. But on her phone, she drew the black part, and see the one on the left, on the on the far side. You can see that it's pretty smooth. It's pretty, she had pretty good control. The one on this side, it's jaggy. She didn't have near the control to do that. But she made those two pieces, and then when she got out of the hospital, uh, she went back and she painted the sunset, sunrise, sunset, and then transferred those sketches to the canvas uh, as, as she did. And she did that, there were several pieces in there that she did that with uh, from in the bed, or one piece she started in 1999, and did not finish it until 2017. And didn't have the mental or physical capabilities of putting the work out. In 2017, they found a cocktail, KU Med Center found a cocktail that would help her, and it worked for three years. So that by the end of 2020, it wasn't working anymore, and they were going through all kinds of cocktails to try to find something that would work. In the meantime, KU was doing brain surgery trials and experiments and trying to figure out what could help her. And they presented the idea of a brain surgery that they thought would be able to remove what was wrong. And so in 2022, February of 2020, I mean January of 2022, they did the surgery. And the doctor came out and was talking to her husband and said, I think it went well. We feel like we've got everything connected. Ten minutes later, the nurse came out and said she's in a major seizure. So they went back in and tried to do some more things. Nothing happened, so for the next 13 months, she was just incapable physically of being able to do anything. And so in, in February of 2023, she died and never was able to see her body of work in a, in a gallery or have a show or anything like that. So it is, it is if you go to her website, and anybody can do that, you can go to, go to my website, click on her page, go to that little button, click on it, and you can read as much as you want about her from her childhood, and during the 17, 18, and 19 is when she created that website during her illness. And so she was, and she wrote, I've got diaries, blah, blah, blah. Day by day, hour by hour, diaries of seizures coming on, going away, what she was doing, what she wasn't doing. And then she, her memory would come back and she'd go back and see that, and see where she was, and pick up and finish the piece that she was working on. Incredible woman. I never met her, I wish I would have. Felt like I got to know her reading her life. 
kind of overwhelmed me at times for a person. miscarriages in her early days while she was in London. She said her first husband was very abusive uh, to her and she escaped that, came to the States in 96, traveled around the desert lands of America and then went back to London in 97, got a divorce, came back to the States and wound up in western Missouri and then a year and a half later, got diagnosed with this. And so, for a human being to be, you know, we all have issues, we all have things that come out on us, but for a human being to have that degree of non-stop, non-stop tragedies is amazing. And for her to have the acumen to put everything together and keep track of it and create this body of work uh, is just amazing. In fact, she, in one of her diary postings, she said, if I didn't have my heart, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a life. So, and, and I, I read it and I look at it and say, wow, the life you have is rough, rough. But she was able to do something very positive about it. So, and part of her, one of her sayings is, I hope that somebody will be able to read this and see this that might help them in the future. That was her order of desire. So it's another instance of what you create goes way beyond your life. It goes way beyond. Um, Thank you. Any questions? If, if you don't mind, I just I'd like to share with you some of my work. Sure. No, 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 no. So, <laughs> I was kind of showing that earlier. <laughs> you were showing it earlier? Yeah, yeah you were aware of it. Okay, this is some of my work. Click on, click on one of them. Well, you don't have to click on one. How about a burn? Yeah, they just hit the arrow off to the side and just blah, blah, yeah, blah, blah, that's blah. Nice. That's nice. So, this is some of my work from 1978 through current. Yeah. One of well, the neighbor, the neighbor. The neighbor yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty rustic. It's in Colorado, right? Yeah. 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 I had a, I had a enjoyable year, I mean, enjoyable career creating images, photographing for people. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> All of them have their own individual stories of what they're trying to get across. Um, have, you, have you had shown? Huh? Have you had you know, Dr. Fish show? No. Come on. We're trying. You should have one. Yeah, you okay. should. My wife said, you can open this gallery and you can show your work. I said, it's not about me. It's about other artists. You can't be So, eventually, I'll do <laughs> that last one there was one of the images I did in Mexico of this meat market guy. Cool. He's he just an interesting character. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Wow. What, can you go back one? Where, where did you take that? that it was in Kansas City, City wow. down by. That's a high school senior. That's awesome. Sixty years old and looking good. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's motherhood. This was then it was then at the Bull Bay at the museum there when they had that. All those instruments are guns. That they have to show up. Yeah. 
This lady was an incredible harpist. She went moved to BC. Just an amazing class act artist. This, I remember for a period of time, I was photographing in nursing homes people that turned 100. And this woman, she was the only surviving member of her family. And so the, the, there was no light in her eye, the feel of despair, they worked, the, the emotion of that is just all alone and sad. That is four years old. And that is four years old. And that is the son, the father, and the first one, 30, 30 years later. Use the same background. Uh, each one of us made it, made it, uh, the I just love slingshot. The, I love the title. Just try and take it like the lollipop. This is awesome. And the other one is just yeah. try and take it too. Yeah, I saw. Same sucker. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's my son. Yeah. And then the one previous is my grandson. So oh. they're taking up four years old. I would, had to get them dirty, so I rubbed dirt on their face and on their clothes. Neither one of them was happy about that. They were not happy about that at all. And so, because they just got these new clothes. And so they were not cooperating. I gave them the sucker, and uh, I said, now give, me a, give it back to me. And that's the expression. I want the sucker back. No. This is one of our friends from, that we have in Colorado that uh, restores vehicles. Uh -huh. And so I have it, we, we still do work in Colorado, so it's kind of cool. You have to write those tricks off. You have to write those <laughs> tricks off. No, we, uh, all of these prints, all these images, through the years in our photography associations, you enter, like you do artists, you enter <coughs> images to be judged, critiqued, and you get a score, and then they receive awards. So all of these have received some kind of award through the years. And go back. So this particular piece, this was just recently judged a couple months ago, and people, the judges, have said, well, this would be hanging on my wall in flash if they had to get a print from it. They just love everything about it. Go to the next one. Same thing with that title, that is the edge of there. And so when you're looking at that, the, the sharpness is right on the front edge of the trees. It's crystal sharp right there. And as it goes back, it loses, loses its definition. So handling the, the camera and exposure was, so when, this is going to be a 40 by 60 print at a home in, in Chattanooga on somebody's wall. It's going to feel good in that home. <laughs> this particular piece here, we did this photograph in uh, the fall of last year, and I've been photographing this family for years, uh, but they could not get together as a family unit, you know, travel places and stuff like that. So we photographed each one of these pieces of people, each one of these families in that location over a six week period. And then we put it together. Oh, wow. So it looks like one family piece. Mm -hmm. That's good. The good Lord smiles every now and then. <laughs> Over a six week period, October through November, it was overcast every one of those days that we did the session. So the lighting was consistent. Mm -hmm. the family on the far 
that far over there, it was snow. <laughs> so, we had little snowflakes kind of going down over the back shirt that we had to get rid of. But we were able to take all those pieces, all those different groupings, and put it together in a way that you could not tell. And it's, the title was Blended Family. And when the judges, the judges had no clue what they were looking at. They just thought it was a family portrait session. And they were, gave us some nice stories and talked about it. Kind of After the fact, when they found out that that was done the way it was, well, if we'd have known that, it'd have been, but you can't tell those kind of stories. So. But the building, the, 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 being able to have the capabilities of seeing the vision, seeing the art before it's done, seeing it completed in your head, and know that I could pay, capture those pieces and put them together into a finished piece. I knew what the, I knew what we could do. They had no clue. They thought they were going to be four different boxes on a piece of paper. And so when they saw it, they were just blown away. Mom, the mom was extremely happy because that's what she wanted. She wanted a complete family. They knew that it couldn't be done. Anyway, so you've been through, that's a body of my work through the years. Storytelling is so fun. Whether you're doing it photographically or if you're doing it with paintings, one of the things when we judge, and I, I, uh, I do a lot of jury sharing for judges. So the judges are coming around the country and we'll sit down and talk about the rules and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that is most important is the, is the impact. If, if you walk into a room and something impacts you, whether it's technically good or not good, if the impact is there, then by golly, you got to buy it. you got somebody that is connected to your art piece. And you can walk into any of these paintings in here, and each one of us will be impacted differently to, to a particular piece. And that is so, so important. I tell them, New young photographers and tell and artists, and students. If you're painting and you're blah blah blah, you all know you turn the painting upside down and you look at it and you see what the, 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 the how it's laid out, how it's flowing, how it's following, and what adjustments you might need to make, and then you turn it back over and finish the piece. It gives it a whole new life.